Hey everybody, welcome back to Linux Weekly, daily Hello. Wednesdays where we sit back, relax, take that midweek break, talk about some of the fun things going on in the world of Linux and open source. I'm Vince Doe, and joined every week by Joe Ryan and everybody watching this live on Twitch. We do a little bit of a pre-show where we talk about things like, uh, what is it like to broadcast from the AEW truck to send the data bits into space and through the skies and get them back to the broadcasting facilities? That's always a fun type of chat I yeah. like having. <laughs> and we talked about Power Rangers. Yes, we did. <laughs> because apparently Netflix is doing a Power Rangers, um, not a reboot, but a, um, they're bringing back some of the original actors. And Jill and I are of a certain yeah. age of work. We were young enough to know of it. It, it existed. It was a cultural thing. We're like, oh, that's what the yeah. kids are watching. And so I, I kind of missed out on that. I don't know if I missed out enough to um, want to revisit it, but I, I think it's neat. Uh, that they're going to be doing that. Yeah, so, me too. I've been doing a couple of things. I've been doing a bunch of uh, streaming, uh, experimental yeah, you streaming, have been. I should say, because mm -hmm. something I'm going to do in 2023, and I, I've been bringing it up, and notice how I bring it up every week. Why? Because if I put it, if I put it out there, I can't backtrack on it. I can't okay, get out yeah. of it. It's like putting it on a public uh, <laughs> calendar. I'm like, oh man, I got to do it now. Um, is streaming on Sundays the editing of Linux Gamecast Weekly, primarily sitting in DaVinci Resolve and you know, getting all that together. And I'm trying to find the best solution to do it at UHD, you know, 2160p consumer 4K. And I'm kind of torn. I don't know, do I want to do it on Twitch or do I want to do it on YouTube? It looks better oh. on YouTube. I mean, oh, of course it does. Because okay. yeah, they support 2160p and I can send it 20 yeah. megabits upload. And I mean, it looks good at full screen. I went back and watched that original VOD I did. And I'm like, that looks good on a, I mean, it's crisp on a 2160p monitor television. On Twitch, I don't have the option. Now, of course, you could feed Twitch 2160p or I could feed it in like 1440p. That might look a little bit better, but I'm still limited by Twitch. It will only take, you know, 65, 6700, okay. you know, 6.5, 6.7 megabits up, which. Yeah. That's that's not enough considering you really want to start at 20 megabits for UHD. And it is doesn't look that good. Even if I bust it all the way down to 1080p, then we try to watch it. It looks pixelated. I mean, it's mm. watchable. And I, I shouldn't say pixelated. It's uh, the, the text from like being downscaled and upscaled just doesn't look all that great. So I don't know. Stay tuned. Um, I might be back doing a live stream on... YouTube again, or I might be back on Twitch. Just keep an eye out in Discord on Sunday. And I'm going to be doing that like way earlier because doing it at one o'clock in the afternoon, my time, which uh. I think is a good time for everybody else because, you know, on the West Coast, it's. Yeah. You know, I got to pop in after right. work. I could pop in. Yeah. It's reasonably early. And in, um, in Europa and Britannia's, it's, you know, it's not too crazy late. And it's, you know, just like 1 p.m. here. But Man, I didn't get done. Like that put my schedule back so far back. I didn't get everything published until like eleven forty three p.m. Uh, <laughs> I think I saw your tweet late too. <laughs> oh man! Yeah. <laughs> so we'll see. Stick around and do that. And one thing I did finish this week, uh, almost to a fault. I've messed up the last part of this recording. I told everybody I'm doing like a Reaper video guide, just like this. I get Reaper set up. Well, it ended up being a two part video. Because I want to show people how I put together a uh, Linux Teamcast Weekly in Reaper so they can adapt that for their shows. And if you're thinking about doing a podcast or just how a doll works, you know, to take it from, hey, I understand how like a channel strip works. I understand how you do the volume uh, noise gate and all that, how to convert that into a doll so you could do it for a podcast or a broadcast or anything that you wanted to do. And it turned out being a two video process because I realized trying to do that in one chunk of a video is going to be like an hour and a half, two hours, and people don't have that kind of patience. So I have the main part of uh, setting up Reaper on Linux, getting everything installed, getting a bunch of really cool free plugins that are open source, set up and installed in Reaper. And the second part is going to be taking a, the Steam segment from Linux Gamecast Weekly with myself, Jordan, and Pedro. I'm going to give you those audio files. So I learn by doing. So you can follow along in the video with everything. And you'll have everything right in front of you. And you can play around with it and learn what everything does and you're going to be able to go back because it's something I really stress and I really encourage. There's no hard rules when it comes to editing audio. If it sounds good at the end, you did a good job. 
don't listen to anybody that says there's only one way to do this because they're, <laughs> they're holy wars about do you do EQ before or after compression? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, people get in the weeds with this stuff. I'm like, does it sound good? The ultimate goal with audio production, what are you doing? You're turning knobs until things sound good. The more you know, and the more you understand about how things work means that it's just going to take you less time to turn those knobs to achieve that effect. That's, yeah. that's it at its base. So I'm going to try to walk you through that and get you something that's nice. you know, going to be sitting at minus 16 lofts or 14 lofts because I, I explain what lofts are. Because, man, people don't understand that. Uh, but I, I want to get that through. I think I did a good job. That'll be out later mm -hmm. this week up for patron. I think that's it, Joe. There we go. Yeah, <laughs> that was a lot. Right? <laughs> You've been busy, you? Ben. <laughs> so I have been really busy, too, getting ready for the Southern California Linux Expo uh, 20X, which is uh, March uh, 9th through 12th here in Los Angeles at the Pasadena Civic Center <laughs> Convention Center. And I, I'm Wait, going when crazy. Is that? When's it coming up? Uh, March, March 9th through 12th. Like this March? <laughs> yes. This March. Yeah, because last year's we had it later in the year. We had it at the end of July because of the pandemic. So things were, you know, uh, delayed. But uh, so, so scale this year is two months earlier <laughs> than normally it's, you know, annually, but this time it's two months earlier because we're getting back on our regular schedule in March. So I've just been really busy er doing everything from uh, planning our. Our Linux Game Crafts crew here in LA doing planning with them, uh, starting to plan my Linux Chicks LA booth. My, I'm also doing the Destination Linux booth and preparing live streams. It's just, it's, it's crazy. And I might be, be uh, uh, a part of some other booths too. <laughs> so I don't know when I'm going to find the time to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good thing you enjoy booths. Yes, this is true. <laughs> I Jill Ryan it. is a booth enthusiast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a fun time, and uh, it will. Yeah, that's a lot of scrambling when you're like, oh, so regular time, two months earlier. Ooh, mm -hmm. mm. two months earlier. So it's kind of thrown me off a bit, even though I did actually get started earlier. It still feels like I'm not ready yet. <laughs> It's usually yeah. when, when things are in such flux and chaos is you never enjoy it in the time, but those are the memories that you look back with a bit of fondness after it's over. After Definitely. the fires are put out, you're like, that was kind of <laughs> yeah. fun. Definitely. So, that's going to be a good time, everybody. Let's get into it this week with something that's itsy bitsy, teeny weeny, yeah. minimal even. Uh-huh. So the lightweight Ubuntu distro Zubuntu, with, which features one of me and Ven's favorite desktop managers, XFCE, they will offer an official minimal image starting with Zubuntu 23.04 that is scheduled for, for release at the end of April. And this minimal image will be small enough to fit on a CD-ROM. <laughs> Go figure. I guess we're thinking about, still thinking about the size of CD-ROMs. We'll, we'll talk about that in a bit. <laughs> but uh, Sean Davis, the Zubuntu technical lead states, he quoted, with Zubuntu Minimal, previously Zubuntu Core, our goal is to ship a slimmed down version of Zubuntu, the core desktop environment, and nothing else. It's well tested and expands on our mission to provide a light, stable, and configurable desktop environment. You get the Zubuntu look and feel with a solid foundation to build your own experience. Woohoo! And yeah, so this is an expansion of the Zubuntu core effort. You know, started back, like uh, Sean Davis said, in 2015. But this, this one will actually be official. It'll be an official derivative, which is really cool. And it'll be made available as a separate download. And it will still use the Ubiquity installer and won't require an active internet connection to complete installation. And, you know, to me, the Zubuntu team actually has a lot of work to do to get it to fit in a 700 megabyte CD image. And uh, that's just, you know, kudos to, 
to you for Zubuntu development team. <laughs> that's that's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to be worth it in the end because it'll be such, you know, I, I love Zubuntu because it was already minimal and lightweight, you know, install, and this will make it even more lightweight, especially for older machines. And it'll be quicker to get it installed and things going. I think it's really neat. I don't think Arthur and mm-hmm. for throwing that into our show notes like you can yeah. as well. And, you know, it's one of those things because getting everything on a CD is a CD too. Let, let's flex this. Now, personally, <laughs> personally, I want my next distribution to come available on uh, eight inch floppies. Yes. Oh, absolutely. There, there are still some available. Eight inch. <laughs> I don't think oh, there was oh, okay. ever. Yeah. No, I yeah. could be wrong. Somebody's released an eight inch floppy I, distribution. I have put a distro before on an eight inch oh, floppy. Oh, being able to copy it. Now, more yes. importantly, I want but a brand new eight inch coming. floppy drive that uses Thunderbolt. Ah, there we go. <laughs> so I can use it with my new Mac Pro. <laughs> oh, man. But getting everything on a single CD, you know, you're talking 700 yeah. megs, 650, whatever, if you're going to overburn it, live a little bit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That's hard. That it's crazy. Yeah, and that that is amazing. <laughs> it's it's easy to just skip over that and be like, no man, like we used to because your first thought was like, no, all my distributions, you know, okay, if you dial it back far enough, yes, yeah, so your distributions like Slackware and uh things like that, they they came on floppies, you know, fourteen, fifteen floppies or low you know, six or seven, depending on what era you were jumping in. And yeah. sometimes you would have x most of the times you wouldn't you'd have to download that and get it set up separately but even back in like red hat 5x days i had to go looking first off good luck to any of my brothers and sisters out there that try to find out how many cds the original red hat 5.0 distribution had because it doesn't exist on google why because everything is red hat enterprise linux 5.0 yeah 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 and i'm like no no google i'm talking about Red Hat. Yeah. Oh, Lennox, yeah, Mount. Good. <laughs> five <laughs> point two one disc. <gasps> two disc. Yeah. I want to use that for a screenshot. Hang on. We're we're gonna do a vanity shot. Okay. <laughs> good anger and confused guess. These are in really good shape. And these are not nostalgia buys off eBay. These are the original uh Red Hat five point two from nineteen ninety eight. And yeah, even back then it was two CDs to get a system up and running. You know, a minimum yeah. install with a Axe server and had like Afterstep or whatever was shipped on it. You didn't have GNOME. I, I don't think this came with GNOME. So I'm sure somebody will correct me. Make sure you're right, though, because I'll come back and recorrect you. Um, I, th- I believe this had Afterstep, uh, a couple of extra packages. There might have been a third CD that was like an application CD, but it didn't count as. Um, oh, yeah. 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 I remember. Yeah. <laughs> So I still have one of my original boxes too of Red Hat discs, six point oh. Well, we had to I think 7. buy them, 0. which is yeah. like the weird thing because <laughs> it would it was completely infeasible in nineteen ninety eight to download um, a CD's worth of information. That didn't happen. Like you couldn't have done. It would have taken months. So you know, this is why you went, you know five point two. That was uh, I think it started like I had had somebody burn me Red Hat five, but five two was the first box copy that I'd bought and. Yeah, this is, this is just something that doesn't cross your mind. I'm glad that somebody's keeping this tradition alive to the point I'm trying to make in the days of net installs and gigabit internet connections. Mm-hmm. Because if you watched yeah. my live stream, uh, the two I did for the Steam Rectangle build, I did two separate installs of Debian, net installs of Linux. And we're talking about a full stack system with a browser, XFCE, of course, SSH server, all the niceties that you would have for a basic desktop installation. And that was being downloaded while I was streaming. Might have took 20 minutes total. So mm-hmm. <laughs> taking the time, it's very much appreciated when we're living in that environment for the specialization required to get everything back on one CD and doing yeah. that for you know places like you're not going to have ready access to the internet like submarines. When was the last time you were in your submarine? You're like, man, I can't install Linux right now. Yeah. <laughs> have to surface. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I still have Linux. In fact, I still I actually do have an 8-inch floppy with uh, Linux on it. And I've got um, lo- lots of uh, classic size floppies, too. And 
all, classic all size the floppy. Classic size. Cloppy flop, <laughs> floppy, floppy classic. <laughs> three point five. No, 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 what do you call? Yeah. What do you? Yeah. What do you call three and a half? Like new, new floppy. Yeah, new floppy. I guess new floppy disks. And uh, yeah, um, in fact, one of my favorite distros Ven was called uh, is called Linux on a floppy, and it comes with X. It boots on a floppy disk with the X desktop. Oh, yeah. And and um, they even just updated it and made a new version of it. So it is possible, you know, <laughs> busy box for, for oh, all having the things. A, I mean, <laughs> for anybody who grew up with like Amiga Workbench, like having a full-blown GUI built on a single disc with a bunch of apps, like, oh, yeah. 100% possible. Like, I oh, mean, yeah, that's what I grew absolutely. up with. Yeah. Um, you know, Arthur, and be careful. They're going to call it cloppy. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one, Artharin. The KDE's and, uh, bootable. <laughs> and uh, Joe, he was saying in chat, what about Ziptis? Well, the very first distro for Ziptis were, were, was Zip Slack. <laughs> so Slackware on Ziptisk. And that was classic. I ran that for quite some time and on oh, my man. SideQuest disks. <laughs> you weenies with your um, Ziptisk. Yeah, I bought the, uh, I bought the yeah. SideQuest one gig drive. And here's the fun thing. Did that connect, mm -hmm. What did that connect over? Parallel port. Parallel port. You I could have, get a SCSI. They yeah. had an external SCSI yeah. 2 option, um, but that also required having an external SCSI 2 card at the time. And as Galaxy, had, I was broke. Yeah. I had no money. Uh, what I did have was parallel port. So you imagine transferring yeah. a gigabyte of information at the speed of smell. <laughs> oh, oh, I know. In fact, this computer right next to me that has a, a SCSI uh, zip zip drive in it and also has a SCSI uh, SideQuest drive in it and I used to uh, store my animation on uh, the SCSI SideQuest drives. <laughs> that was a thing. In fact, when I was doing animation for the studio, sometimes we had to send the Sci SideQuest drives to the studios. Like I remember doing it for Warner Brothers and NBC. <laughs> so I had to go look this up. <laughs> the data transfer speed of... Um... Mm -hmm. EPP enhanced parallel port. Oh yeah, look, yeah. What do you get? What are you going to guess it was? No uh, cheating. No cheating. I I'd know, say. no cheating. Well, I had one. I had an easy 135 parallel port SideQuest drive, and I just got to remember what the, the specs on that. Uh, uh, 50 kilobytes. I don't know. <laughs> now, if, if we're dealing with like Moon Future. <laughs> parallel ports uh old school epp because you remember you you would go into the bios and, and enable epp it, right yeah enhance yeah. parallel port to get that extra juice mm -hmm. ladies and gentlemen 150 kilobits oh, okay. a second now you think okay. about that when we're talking about like mm, yeah and yeah transferring a gig over that yes we were yeah yeah that's it i remember doing that with both a zip drive and a sidequest because i had parallel port versions that i take to school with me <laughs> to college <laughs> <laughs> it was a it was a different time, but um, let, let's go ahead and close this chapter and get off our lawn cast. Um, okay, <laughs> we're me and Van having fun and with our retro hardware. <laughs> put away our rocking chairs and quit telling the children. <laughs> yes. like, Back in my day, like who cares? I don't know. People watch the vintage um, shows on YouTube, right? Oh yeah. Oh Van, I even have a video capture card that used parallel port, and believe it or not, they had a. Uh, some kind of uh, neat technology with it that it actually looked halfway decent. It looked better than some of the PCI <laughs> video capture <laughs> cards I had. Well, they probably could have done some type of the only capture card yeah. um, back then, the only <laughs> PCI Express, not even, oh, look at, look how easily I said PCI Express, PCI. Yeah. A uh, capture mm -hmm. card I had was, uh, it did it over SCSI. Yeah. And uh, th that was still like a weird, amazing thing. And it could do, I think it maxed out at like 280. Mm -hmm. yeah 280 yeah um but being able to just put video and like see it on the monitor was like a weird thing you're like oh so man the future's here all right yeah <laughs> Let, let's let's quit being old uh because yes <laughs> there is a an old saying from the old times that when a problem comes along you must whip it and whip it good <laughs> into shape yes <laughs> you know, we need to talk about Whipper. Whipper is a Python 3 3.6 CDDA ripper based on the Morituri, Morituri yeah. project, CDDA Morituri. ripper for inks 
and uh, aiming for accuracy over speed. Now, this just started as a fork, but it's been improving. It's got bug fixes, and now the code base diverges significantly from whence it came. And there's like a nice little walkthrough of all the features and stuff like this. And here's the thing, man. You know, I want you to think about this as like a Linux version. This is for my brothers and sisters that like ripping audio CDs. I know you're out there too. Like, mm-hmm. there's more of you than people realize. Uh, you might be familiar with uh, something called Exact Audio Copy (EAC) for Windows. Yeah. And you know what? You you like you like the process. You like the what you're doing there. You know, ripping CDs is a bit of your hobby, and I, I'm down with that. But I, I started doing a little bit of reading, a little bit of reading. Like, why? Why do you need an accurate CD ripping? Because that sounds like something an audiophile would say, no, doesn't it? They're like, no, mm-hmm. no. You say the software's accurate with a digital ripping. I'm like, that sounds a little sus. Um, <laughs> that's a digital thing. Yeah, there's, there, there's no analog hole here. Well, I, I was reading, I, I landed on a post on Hacker News where Leo Panthera explained it like this. He said, you know, unlike DVDs, CDs, they don't have sector information. There's just a long, continuous spiral of bits. So there's no easy, exact way to tell where on the spiral the head is pointing. Now, to compensate for this, data CDs include an intermittent data, include intermittent data on the spiral that says, you were here. But, you know, audio CDs, they don't have that. So yeah. that's why programs like this, programs like this, uh, they do... Uh, they rip everything in overlapping chunks and then they compare the overlaps to see if it's correct. And, and you know what? In 2023, ripping CDs is kind of like ripping records. Because, yes. you know, <laughs> you do it for the experience. And you're like, hey, I like to copy the CD. I like to find the album art and put it together and organize it. And that's cool because, I mean, your, your the audio source on a CD is 44.1 and 16 bits of dynamic range. It sure, I mean, it's vintage sound in 2023. Yes. Fight me on that, uh, but you know people buy, people back up their mm. records. You know. I'm oh like, yeah, I do that too. <laughs> you do it because you like the process of doing it. Yeah, yeah, and I actually recently have uh, me and my husband. Uh, we 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 have thousands of CDs in our collection as well as over a thousand records, and I do this every once in a while. I get out one of my my older rare discs and get it out and make a rip copy of it. And I actually did that a lot when I was DJing. <laughs> 16 years of, of DJing uh, synth and electronic music. So, yeah, so to not harm the CDs, I would often rip them and then play them on the computer. So that is a thing. This is a really good thing. And, and yeah, then um, I've actually used more Turi. I'd, I'd used it years ago. So it was really nice to see a new uh, fork. Of more Terry, and the cool thing also is is that this uses CD Paranoia for the actual ripping as the back end, which I really like. That's always been one of my, you know, favorite uh, utilities. And then it uses CDR DAO for for session and the table of contents and the pre gap and and all the information. <laughs> yeah, this is a really great. Whipper is is really great, and I love it that it runs in CLI. Woohoo! <laughs> well, you can automate it, which yeah. is kind of interesting. I mean, if you want to like, capture, <sighs> here, yeah, that's right. You haven't done anything to upset people yet this episode, Ben. If you want to capture like really bad audio quality from an audio CD, now you can. Yeah, <laughs> and it'll be accurate bad audio yes. quality. <laughs> <laughs> do that instead of ripping it at 16x or 32x where you degrade the signal from <laughs> you, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay here let, let me help with making everybody angry you wouldn't be able to tell the difference trust me i can null test it and i can prove you wrong with maths i dare somebody to argue with me with this because i will <laughs> rake you across the coals <laughs> yeah <laughs> um and arguably like here's the thing like you know music cds to us that was a it was a massive jump in quality wasn't it Oh yeah, yeah. Absolutely. We went like from tape. Yeah, and the kids, tapes, chill, the, chill, sounds the, of chill, the children are listening to tapes again. It, what's Yay! Wrong? Hey, they want physical media, and tapes are easy to record on. <laughs> Dude, um, <laughs> mixed tapes. <laughs> I spent a lot of time last week looking up uh, being able to record to eight track or tape, the feasibility of it because I thought it would be like a fun goof. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
I'm not making any promises. I'm just saying. Okay. The, the, <laughs> it would be cool. <laughs> it, it would be the novelty experience to do like, I don't know, like maybe 10 tapes of an LGC podcast. Cause like the reality of like, cause I don't have duplicators or anything like that. Yeah. Might be fun to do. I'm not making any promises, so I'm not even pretending and even say that. But my point was like CD being able to get, you know, 16 bits of dynamic range at 44 one sample rate was a big jump. Um, but you know, like you do have to consider like the first decade of CDs, nobody knew how to master to them correctly. Mm -hmm. You know, then we get mm -hmm. things like the loudness war where dynamic range was sacrificed to make everything louder. And fortunately, you know, in 2023, most people aren't buying physical media, especially audio CDs, because like that's why. Why would you want to degrade the audio to put it on a CD? Because yes, if you're busting something down to 44 one 16 bit, you're degrading the audio because it was not recorded at 44 one 16 bit. It yeah, was, yeah, <laughs> probably recorded yeah. at 96 or 192, a 32 bit floating point. Um, uh huh. And some studios did the uh, compression worse than others. <laughs> it was that was obvious. <laughs> It's not necessarily yeah. when you're doing, you're, you're changing something from what you've recorded. And a lot of times it was on analog, but even if you, you have to do like do resampling and there's different resampling methods uh, to get something to, you know, what you're listening to right now. If you're listening to this in podcasts, it's uh, 48K and bit depth doesn't really matter in MP3. I know you might want to try to fight, fight me on that. Again, I will prove you wrong. Um, I say that with no ego, just research it yourself. But a lot of people will take a 48K recording. You know, your audio interface is recording at 48K. Mm -hmm. Mine's recording at 48K. Everything's in process. We're sending to Twitch at 48K. And we're recording everything at 48K. 48K is the uh, film, TV, and industry standard for audio. That's yeah. a sample, right? And uh, that's something I bring up in the video. I'm like, there's no need to take. Why would you want to take it down to 44.1? There hasn't been an audio player made in the last 20 years that can't do 48K. Yeah, I know. Yeah. Well, once we got... Uh, DVDs became popular, then 48K was the standard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was just a thing. It was awesome. And we're, <laughs> it's just weird. People get hung up on weird things, especially like for audio. Now, audio, it's just ingrained, right? Nobody really, I mean, you look at CDs, pe people are buying, people buy records and stuff like that for the nostalgia. But yeah, I mean, you, you want flack these days if you're getting you know, a song, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Or uh, tapes, which which is weird, which is weird. Um, you know, Sony just released a new Walkman. I posted that yeah, in the Discord. Yeah, they uh, sure did. It's running yeah. Android 12. You can't play tapes on it. So I would take issue with calling it a Walkman because I know, um, <laughs> what was it? What's his name? Uh, Techmoan would really be happy yeah. if somebody released a high quality tape player. Absolutely. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think that's going to exist. All right. I think we were talking about ripping audio CDs there, Jill. So I think yes, we're, we're we were. <laughs> Let's Whipper, talk about something. Go grab it. <laughs> All this is going to be in the show notes. Let's talk about something that won't be quite as divisive: desktop managers <laughs> revisiting <laughs> KDE. And this is kind of interesting because what is it like going back to KDE after? quite some time off um like a really long time off too and that's what our pal jack decided to do and oh boy he wrote down his experience and yeah he did he, he did uh, a cardinal sin jill because not only did he, he write do? down the good stuff he also dared write down the bad yeah he did he and did people get really job. upset with you when you point out actual flaws and those people are called zealots and you should ignore them mm -hmm. so Check this out. Uh, he lets us know what it, you know, <laughs> what it, it's, uh, my brain doesn't want to read what I wrote down. Uh, he lets us know about the could, the cad, and the cuggly. <laughs> that, that's hilarious, man. <laughs> Ooh, Which he, wah, wah, wah. Uh, I'm just saying, man, uh, you know, <laughs> if, if this was KDE back in the 90s, everything started with a K. The good, the bad, and the yeah. ugly, indeed. Even, um, you know, he does talk about K1 customization, multi-monitor support, all praised along with like theming. And of course, Kate, mm -hmm. like everybody, Classic. like, yeah, everybody knows Kate. Kate's just like a super advanced, crazy program that even if you're on Noom, you know about Kate. He does talk about the crashes. I'm going to spell that with a K2. <laughs> you know, to run its issues with, um, 
going to sleep and like screen locking issues. And it's just like, these are always interesting for me to read Joe, because mm-hmm. uh, by all accounts, I was a KDE zealot. I was that yeah. person, you know, back way back when before, you know, but pre 4.0, probably like right at 4.0. But before that, if you said something bad about KDE, I would dare say you were besmirching <laughs> a perfect infallible project. And how dare you? You yeah. were harming Linux <laughs> by saying, and you know, 4.0 knocked that right out of my mouth because I remember 4.0 came out at a time where SSDs didn't exist. And yeah. the, my first experience mm-hmm. with 4.0 was all the hype and all the good, and this is going to be great. And I opened that, like the launching menu and how it slid from left to right to go to the next scene to show you the stuff. Took like a half second. It had to hit the hard drive to do that every time. Yeah. And that just, that just made me bounce. You know, that was 15 years ago. And that's what caused me to like sit and reassess what I required in a desktop. It doesn't matter what I was using. Like, what do I really need? What do I, do I really need all the, uh, all the whiz and all the bang and all the fancy stuff? And that, you know, K- KDE 4.0 caused me to go back to CDE, and from there I went to XFCE. But what are your thoughts yeah. on reading through this? Uh, I, I I just thought it was a good read. Everyone should yeah. go through and revisiting something. Does it does it make me want to go back to KDE? No, but I like to see another person's experience. Oh yeah, I know. Um, the things that he pointed out that I was really impressed with, impressed with, and and there are the little details. Um, that I really like about KDE are the applets because yeah, usually in GNOME, when you want to go, um, you know, change everything from, you know, your monitor, uh, uh, brightness to, you know, uh, your audio settings, you have to go into the full settings to do it. But when KDE, they always had those convenient little applets on the bottom of the taskbar, which were really nice. And I was happy that he mentioned that, although GNOME is fixing that. <laughs> They've got the quick menu now, which really helps. <laughs> but I think this was really a, a well-written, uh, well-written guide and, and his journey with KDE. Oh, KDE, yes, has always had awesome multi-monitor support. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And... Uh, I, I'm like Vin, actually. I use KDE a lot pre 4.0. In fact, the last version I really used was 3.5. And as a result of that, I still like, I like to use the Trinity desktop environment, which is a fork of uh, KDE 3.5. Well, he starts this out with like, y'all remember <laughs> Oxygen? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, of course I did. You know, I, I immediately felt, and that's how this, you know, screenshot yeah, shot. There it is. Starts yeah. off. It was like, show me KDE. And like, oh, look, that, yeah, I guess maybe a while back, you know, less than a decade mm-hmm. ago, it looked like that. And like, no, show me the real KDE. And I'm like, okay, I guess it looks like that now. Um, tons of options, tons of themes. I'm like, no, show me the real KDE. And I'm like, there we go. That's more like it. Yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's the visual hey. nightmare that i grew up with um, oh that was back when it was the cool desktop environment it was man and you yeah. know we had like the little gears everywhere I'm, I'm trying to get it to give me <laughs> let me see if i can move that up so i can show you guys like <laughs> the launcher was like this mis- mish- mishmash of osx theme yeah. stuff that and it didn't always quite line up right and it was uh now I joke about this. We're joking about this. Uh, This is one of the reasons that I still like, I want Enlightenment to be stable enough to use because Mm -hmm. Enlightenment holds that like hipster aesthetic. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. Definitely that look and feel. Yeah, it's got that old (laughs) feel to it. Yeah. But, you know, that's interesting to like revisit. And he does make a good point about, you know, KD went through a long patch of people calling it resource hungry and not very performant. Mm hmm. What I didn't like with what he wrote was trying to pretend that wasn't 100% true. Because for mm. a long time, it ran really bad. And it used a lot of resources. Let's not pretend the yeah. dark times didn't happen. Let's not do that revisionist history. That was a problem. It, it was better. heavier than Gnome. And that was saying something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. Down. yeah. Yeah. Today, you know, it, it really 
honestly, in the last few years, it has really improved KDE. Um, a lot of bugs have been cleaned up, and it is one of the most, honestly, one of the most beautiful desktop managers out there. If that, if that's that's what you want, you know, the beautiful plasmoids. And Stereotype for being quite buggy and resource hungry. That's because it was. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was. <laughs> um, stereotypes exist for a reason. Unfortunate as that is. <laughs> yeah. Man, I like it. Um, Me too. And I know Jordan's been playing around with GNOME as well. I, to me, KDE and GNOME fall into the same camp of like mm -hmm. bloated, heavy, overweight, heavy, whiz bang. Yeah, I mean, yeah. for my uses. And I, I'm only yeah. speaking for me. I'll never change my mind about that. Not like I'm trying to change anybody else's <laughs> mind. Yeah. Um, I like stripped down, bare bones. I, I barely, I, I want something that's like a notch above a window manager, right? Yeah. That's all like I need. You wanted that in between, which was really nice. Yeah, just, just a little, little more. I don't yeah. want to. I, I don't want to deal with config files to set things up. I'm, those <laughs> days are gone, man. Like I've done that. I, I've I lived still that love life. my window maker. I just have my all my config saved in the cloud. We've been then, over. So you got some <laughs> weird hobbies. Okay? Yeah, I love those old minimal X <laughs> window environments. I'm just not doing that anymore, man. I want that nice. <laughs> This is where I like the GUI stuff. Like, let me configure something like basic things. And uh, also, somebody from XFCE, since I know some of you, um, listen, make it a little easier to disable the group tabs for the Windows mm. by default. Mm. Or, you know, because A, the first thing, go back and what if you want to watch uh, when I was doing the rectangle thing. Step one for Vin, I'm going to have 11 terminals open out of the box because that's just I live that terminal life with doing stuff. Mm -hmm. And they were all stacked under one, not clearly labeled. There are like three awkward steps to get to that. It's such a clue that I can't remember how to do it. I have to Google it. <laughs> I have to relearn re it. <laughs> so, yeah, if you're using KDE, write us a note, leave a comment on the video, let us know why. Um, maybe, I would like to hear from somebody using a desktop manager um, or like a cracked out window manager that I just don't know of because I know they're out there. Like something that has been sneaking around is maintained. I'm not talking about something that was made, you know. 15 yeah, years, years ago, ago that received one version you got it running on a vm talk about something you use day in day out love to hear about that no yeah mm -hmm. do you know what else i like joe what what do you like when people are like man <laughs> this is a funny show we want to support it and they do they head over Yay. to patreon.com pick a membership level and get a bunch of cool stuff in return probably more than we should give out but hey we do that up to including access to our super secret Discord that we hang out in the other six days of the week. If you like this show, this is a little tiny, squishy middle. We got the two-hour version of this. Why are you leaving that on the table? You need a tech talk to sit back and listen to during the day? There it is. You get your own custom RSS feed. But man, maybe you want to watch the visual thing. Live stream. Ready to go. Also, the recorded version. That's available for patrons. Early access to things later on this week if you're interested about a little bit of audio production or Linux. Or how do you make a podcast? How do you install a DAW? What is a DAW? What are plugins, Ben? <laughs> yeah. I'm going to have that out for you to peruse. And I, I've turned it into a play-at-home game. I'm going to give you some audio files where you can follow along in the video. And it won't cost you anything to do. Nothing. So stay tuned for that. Later this week, we do the game streams on Tuesdays and Fridays, Jill and myself. Yay. We do Filthy Casuals. We got a super secret private track media server that we set up. 14 new tracks each and every week. We encourage it's a great community night if you want to come hang out. Two different Sounds times, fun. 5 p.m. on Tuesdays mm -hmm. and 7.30 p.m. in two different modes. On Fridays, we do a points match where we... It's not, racing... Fun air and quotes, Right. Yeah. Like, we're, we're just there to have fun. It's a good time if you're looking for a bunch of people some Linux-loving miscreants to get together and chat with. And Wednesday, we do this show. Thursday, Jordan does, uh, he's going through Jorderlands right now, Borderlands 3, yeah. if you want to join him for that. And Friday and Saturday, Linux Teamcast Weekly. And Sunday's time to be determined. Um, you'll get, uh, I'm trying to come up with a name for it, but basically me editing Linux Teamcast Weekly. So mm -hmm. you can just show mm -hmm. up and ask some questions. And I want to do like the SpongeBob font i you know the uh, irony like me and you can edit content on linux oh, uh, that would be fun because <laughs> I, I i've seen i want to name names so i want to get mm, I wanna, you could literally say three hours later because yeah. sometimes the, the streams are four to six hours four long. hours six hours man. <laughs> um, dude. uh 
it's just I, I last week set me off because I saw two different people who produce Linux content, and one of them even has like Linux in their like title of what they do on YouTube. Say on Twitter in response that they can't do their content production and uh, distribution uh, on Linux. Oh. <laughs> they were explaining why they do it on Windows. No, no, no. That... <laughs> oh, jeez. I, I had Horrible. to stay out of it. I had to stay out of yeah. it. So, and, and instead of arguing on the internet, Joe Bryant, I think yeah. what is better for everybody, show, show, show by example. Just do it. Yeah. And Sunday's like, hey, look, we're doing a multimedia content production distribution setting up. You got questions about how to do it. Come on yeah. over, ask, ask questions. Because what that person is really saying is, I don't know how to do it on Linux. Yeah, exactly. And they don't. They're not willing to learn it. Yeah, yeah, it sounds really bad when you when you're billing yourself as a Linux expert, right? Yeah. Like, and your whole stick is like, I'm the Linux expert. Like, well, why don't you do that? Well, you can't say because because I don't know how to do it. Um, Yeah. Well, maybe you can learn how to do it, and we can help out with that. I think that'll be fun. (laughs) So, thank you, patreoncom forward slash Linux Teamcast. Get your names and credits and all that. But I need. I got to thank somebody. Yeah, you do, Van. Because you might have noticed, you might have noticed, uh, this, is, this is a recurring offender, actually. <laughs> <'Cause> <laughs> cool. You might have noticed on Saturday that Jordan was looking a little, a little different. Yes. I, I, I love the chicken head. Yes. <laughs> Jordan had on a chicken outfit, uh, chicken mask, because uh, Jordan collects horror show uh, panda yeah. masks and stuff like that. That was his thing. Mm-hmm. And that uh, came from somebody, but they forgot to write in a little bit of a note. Oh. So if mm-hmm. you don't know, on LinuxTeamCast.com, we got a little thing. I got a couple of things on here that I'm bad about reminding people. If you're curious about everything in the studio, go to the About section, go to the studio. Everything that's in here, everything you've ever seen in any video is listed. It's itemized. It's in categories. And I'm not saying buy it from Amazon. Buy it for wherever you want. But another thing we got. Mm-hmm. is support of course patreon that's what i brought up best way to support us and get some stuff in return um we do have a merch store but we also have a wish list we got one for the studio jill's got one pedro's got one and jordan's got one i don't have one personally just because like whatever i'd rather get stuff for the studio yeah and if you pick something off of this list which absolutely should be a 500 hundred dollar keyboard or a two thousand dollar video ah. because <laughs> oh oh van you need you need that that keyboard to make your streams on Sunday a little easier. <laughs> See, Jill, this this is all a long play for me to con myself into justifying <laughs> buying a five hundred dollar keyboard. Yes. <laughs> Somebody bought something off of our list, and it's not just crazy fancy stuff like that. I use the studio wish list for things that are just in rotation, up to and including Amazon Basics HDMI cables. Yay! They work great. Dude, uh, that's all I got. Uh, Between, yeah, I got, okay, there's probably a mixture of um, Amazon Basics and uh, Monoprice. Monoprice, yeah. (laughs) HDMI cables going to HDMI. Also excited about these, you know, these are like 0.9 meters, like little short ones. Jill and I were Mm -hmm. talking about why those are cool. Uh, Go back and listen to the pre-show if you want. But it was from the same person who purchased the uh, chicken net, from aromatic underscore dev. Thank you, aromatic underscore dev. Enjoy your gift. And guess what? I keep my word. Even if it's some HDMI cables, you are on the fine up sand account. There you go. Boom. Yeah. Gotcha. I always always wanted to have one of these little walls because I used to watch people put them up. And I'm like, that is so cheesy. Ew. So now I finally got one. Oh, I got it because uh, I think it's like ironic to do like walls and stuff like that. I love it. It Yours is the prettiest one, though, because it's uh, neon colors. (laughs) <laughs> so um yeah basically the moral of the story i absolutely need a two thousand dollar water cooled uh, gpu joe <laughs> yes you do <laughs> i do need to build that epic server um that that's going to be one of our 2023 things because that's if we start doing some 4k streaming and content creation that's uh going to be interesting yeah looking forward to oh it. and thank you to mac geek for his uh 17th month resub x17 yeah. <laughs> Indeed. All right. Uh, what do we need to talk about, Jill? 
Uh, I was going to say it, but I'll also let you say it because you say it better. <laughs> here's here's oranges on a what is that? It looks like a plastic orange and and two orange cakes. I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> orange shaped cakes. Like if an orange was cut in half and there's the two halves. <laughs> so what are we talking about? So we are talking about a Pi network attached storage or a Pi NAS. <laughs> so um, the, this is the developer who's building an orange Pi NAS that really looks like a NAS or network attached storage device for less than 60 US dollars. That is one slick looking Pi NAS. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's really beautiful, actually. And he has a he has also a, a black and a yellow one, which is really nice. And so the developer, uh, Toby Chewy, I I'm sorry, I, I'm probably mispronouncing his name, but it's T O B Y C H U I. He's a university student from Hong Kong. You know, had uh, he had these design design goals for his pine ass. He wanted it to be a small footprint, low cost, high compatibility, so it should work with parts that can be purchased all around the globe, low dependencies, and acceptable speed. It should be able to play back 1080p video and the such. And uh, it has actually a lot, <laughs> a lot of supplies, and I'll mention a few of them. Uh, SATA to USB 2.0 adapter, Orange Pi Zero, or, the, the, this is interesting, or any SBC that can fit inside this case, including a Raspberry Pi 4, Orange Pi, or Zero, etc. And it's got a custom power management PCB. It's it's got uh, lots of fans, and it um, has a. It's just really a beautiful looking case, and I was impressed because he has all the STL 3D models that you can download, and he even has a separate STL 3D model of the back of the backplate template that can be modified depending on the SBC that you use because. Gosh, we know it's hard to get a hold of a Raspberry Pi, <laughs> so <laughs> there are other SBCs that you can use. And well, I mean, the entire build thing with this is uh, <laughs> not using a Raspberry Pi, and that's what caught me yeah. off guard. Like, from the step yeah. one, this is what we're going to start seeing a lot more of, to touch on what Joe was just saying. Mm -hmm. we, we've been in a Raspberry Pi drought coming on three years, so what was I saying last year at the end of last year? You're going to start seeing things like build guides, uh, having to use something different because people still want to build cool things like this. And this most certainly falls in the cool things oh, category. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And right there in the title, this is a DYI orange pie NAS. As yeah. is, you know, yes, you can make a Raspberry Pi NAS, whatever, but this is like <laughs> the reality. And you're going to start seeing, I think it's going to be the rock chip based stuff, but look how pretty that is too. Yeah, it's beautiful. And and to look, he, he did an excellent article on his, um, how he put it all together and the build and all the instructions and all the parts. So make sure to check our show notes on that. So we couldn't get through them all. There's too much good stuff there. And another thing I was really impressed with is that the developer um, developed his own Linux distro for the NAS called Ares OS. And Ares OS is a web desktop web operating system that provides you with a full-fledged desktop experience within your browser. So good on you. Very talented, both in open source software and hardware. Mm -hmm. I, I, I saw that um, mm -hmm. Arthur was talking about getting a beige one. I'm like, you know what? How about some wood grain? Since it's 3D printed, <laughs> yes, we absolutely. can make this thing look like a diseased Atari 2600, man. Yeah. With yes. a big chunky slip. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Then we can print Absolutely. out a Groot. Yeah, a Groot. Ooh, yes. <laughs> you could put a Groot on top of it. <laughs> that would be cute. Yeah. Right yeah. On there. I am Groot. You're Nass. It could be the, be the uh, Groot Nass. Or a gecko, <laughs> maybe. Yeah, or a gecko. Or Tex the Penguin. <laughs> it's a wizard, a Christmas tree. See, this is why I don't have a 3D printer. Yeah. <laughs> I just yes. sit around and do stuff like this all day. All right, wrong button. Um, 
All right. That's going to do it, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for hanging yeah. out with us. Uh, running a little long, but we had a lot covering. You know, we, yes. we, we, we had to like turn into the old people that told you about the good old days and all this fun stuff. So we got yeah. on the side tracks. That was fun. <laughs> Thanks for watching. See you next week. And uh, yeah, if you get a chance, come hang out with us live. And me and Jill will be back Friday. Yeah. 7.30. If you want to be there, play along. Woohoo. All right. Now, let's see <laughs> if I did this thing right. Maybe. Yay. We have lots of people in chat to thank, including Oil of Hope, Arthurin. I'm just trying to think of stuff Justin, I'd print in wood Don. <laughs> Gosh, I had Steve Husband in there. We have DSMG Joe. And look at all our beautiful producers. Uh, we got <laughs> too many to mention. I couldn't get through it quick enough. <laughs> Jill's going to our... fill some time, but not tell you who it was. Matt is a yeah. mystery. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. They're like, oh, man, you should see. Oh, this is so great. I wish you could see it. It, it's, <laughs> yeah. it would be so much better if you could see it, but you can't. It moves too fast. What I need to do is do screenshots of any of those <laughs> so I can have them up. <laughs> All right, beautiful people. Get out there. Plenty of, plenty of time left in this week. Love all our Go do patrons. some great with the Linux. <laughs> Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Love you all. <laughs> Even the wood green people. Yes. Here's to you, LGR. <laughs> <laughs>